Good morning. I am Reverend Dr. Mark Boyer, the minister here at First Parish Church Congregational in Manchester by the Sea, Massachusetts. And it is once again my pleasure and privilege to welcome you here to this time of remembrance and recollection and reflection and recommitment to God and God's ways as best embodied for us in the Christian tradition through the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. I welcome you here on this last Sunday in the month of March, on this Palm Sunday, this day when we enter Holy Week by commemorating Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem in the days leading up to his death and then his triumphant resurrection. I welcome you here to this place where in the congregational part of our tradition, you are fully welcome, no matter who you are or where you are on your spiritual journey. This is a place where, again, the congregational part of our Christian tradition means that we are democratically governed and that all members of the spiritual community have an equal say, an equal part in the work of this community. And so now with that, I also invite you to join in the singing of this morning's opening hymn, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty, the words to which are printed in your online bulletin. I also now invite you to join in this morning's opening prayer, the words to which are also printed in your online bulletin. Today we begin the final stages of the journey through Lent. We go with Jesus into Jerusalem. We join with those who celebrate, honor, and promise to follow him all the way. But they will not. When the days of celebration turn to struggle and the struggle turns to hardship, then threat, then loss, then death, one by one they will disappear, fall away, lose heart. Will we? Help us, Holy One, to stay the course, 
Give us the strength, courage, and trust to stay faithful to what you call us to do in times of struggle. Help us to stay committed to what needs to be done for the good of your people when the road becomes longer and more difficult to travel. Help us to follow Jesus' way of compassion and sacrifice through all our hardest journeys. And with his life of courage, strength, compassion, and sacrifice to inspire and guide us, let us say together now the words he gave us. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it, as it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ we glory, 
Thank you both. Great stuff. As we come to this morning's time of prayer, I once again ask you to continue to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits all healthcare workers and scientists, medical personnel, first responders, all those who continue to work so diligently to alleviate the effects of COVID-19 on those who contract it as well as their families and friends, especially right now, those who are working so hard to get vaccinations out and into people's arms. And on that note, I again encourage you, please get vaccinated as soon as you are able, not just for your own sake, but in the spirit of our Christian tradition and in the idea of covenant that stems from the very first parts of the biblical tradition. The idea of covenant being that we are truly all in this together, that what affects one affects all. I also continue to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits, teachers and students, parents and school leaders, all those who continue to also work so diligently to do right by our students in the circumstances that they are given. I ask you to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits the people of the Southeast who are again experiencing the destruction caused by tornadoes. I ask you to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits the people of Myanmar as again a large number of people have been killed by the military for simply protesting the military's takeover of that country. I also ask you to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits the Rohingya refugees as a fire at one of the largest refugee camps that they are living in left 15 dead hundreds missing, and thousands displaced once again. And then, of course, I also ask you to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits the families and loved ones of the dead from this past week's mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado. Lastly, we have a number of birthdays that we will be celebrating uh, this day and this week. First off, Bruce Warren has let us know that his dad, Hugh's birthday was uh, this past Wednesday, March 24th, and so we rejoice with Bruce and with Hugh. And then interesting, at least to me, considering that this is Holy Week, we have three birthdays in this spiritual community, all on Monday Thursday, or as it is also known, Holy Thursday. This coming Thursday, Pat Zeller, Sam Peterson, and Paul Godonis are all celebrating their birthdays. And so we rejoice with all of them during this special time in this special week. So with all of those joys and concerns, all of those prayer intentions that we have already shared, I invite you to now add your own. Share them with those who you might be with or simply offer them up to the God in silence of our hearts and minds at this time. Please join me in prayer. God of all our days, on this day, we remember Jesus' final entrance into Jerusalem. We remember people, people like us, shouting and rejoicing at his presence, honoring him as the one who would help save them in their struggles. But we also remember this day that the celebration 
like Jesus would be short-lived. We remember that people, people like us, would lose interest in him, become disillusioned that he was not or ever would be who they wanted him to be, even reject him out of hand and leave the powers that be free to take his life. Still, though, it is because he chose to take the path he knew would lead to a cross, a path he could have turned back from, that God's hope, grace, love, and salvation became embodied and available to us. So lead us, O oh God. Lead us to bring that hope, grace, love, and salvation to others. For there are still far too many in need of that hope, far too many in need of that grace, far too many in need of that love, far too many in need of that saving. On this Palm Sunday, then, draw us closer to you on the final steps of the journey of Lent. Enter our lives as Jesus entered Jerusalem and help us to stay to stay with you and with him all the way. Amen. Give me
Thank you, Rebecca. Wonderful. Now I invite you to share with me now these words from Mark's Gospel. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there, and as soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, The master needs it, and he will send it back right away. So they went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and then they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said, and so they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. And then many people spread out their clothes on the road to Jerusalem, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus then entered the temple. And after he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. Then Jesus spoke to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a tower. Then he rented it to tenant farmers and took a trip. When it was time, he sent a servant to collect from the tenants his share of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants grabbed the servant, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again, the landowner sent another servant to them, but they struck him on the head and treated him disgracefully. The landowner sent another one, and that one the tenants killed. The landlord sent many other servants, but the tenants beat some and killed others. Now the landowner had one son whom he loved dearly, so he sent him last to the vineyard, thinking, They'll respect my son. But those tenant farmers said to each other, This is the heir. So let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. They grabbed him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. So what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. What did he see? Jesus. What did he see late that evening when he went into the temple after arriving into Jerusalem earlier that day before the start of the Passover festival? What did he see? The writer of Mark's Gospel tells us that He went into the temple late that evening and looked around at everything before he left. Other translations say he took stock of everything before he left. What did he see? Or perhaps, given that late evening in not just the Bible, but in other cultures and spiritual traditions as well is often a symbol for the time and setting of spiritual visions, what did Jesus envision that evening in the temple? Maybe where it was all headed. Where it was all headed for him, 
for the people, for the religious leaders, for Rome, for all of them, if they didn't get it. If they didn't get who he really was and was really all about, and especially if they didn't get his entrance into Jerusalem. Earlier that day, Jesus enters the city on an animal, a colt, that had never been ridden before. Just like Roman military conquerors and political leaders so often did. Except that while Roman military conquerors and political leaders rode into town on stallions or war horses, Jesus rides in on a colt, or in the Greek of the Gospels, perhaps just as accurately, the foal of a donkey. Hardly a powerful, intimidating presence. Jesus has flipped what is known as a Roman triumphus completely on its head. That procession, that parade for Roman military conquerors and political leaders. In the spirit of the prophet Zechariah, who centuries before had said to the Israelite people, look, your king is coming, humble and riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And he will bring peace to the nations. The bow of war and violence will be cut off. Jesus turns that triumphant triumphus completely on its head in the spirit of the prophet Zechariah and in the spirit of the writer of the Gospel of Mark, nobody gets it. One of the consistent themes throughout the Gospel of Mark is what scholars refer to as the messianic secret. The idea that from start to finish in Mark's Gospel, Almost nobody gets who Jesus really is and what he is really all about, and that certainly is the case here. The people don't get it. They lay branches and cloaks on the road before him, a sign of honor, a sign of honor given to military conquerors and political leaders. They shout Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, a word that means save us. But then they say, blessed is the one who comes to bring about the kingdom of our ancestor David. What that means is they see Jesus as the long-awaited, long-expected Messiah who will be a descendant of David and in that time and place understood to be a military and political leader, one that for them in their time and place will come and rid them, drive out the hated Romans through violence. The people don't get it. The Romans don't get it. They take Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem as a mocking of the triumphus, which it is in a sense, but they see it as a provocation. They see it as Jesus attempting to start another violent uprising among the people against them. Another in a long line of violent uprisings led by perceived and self-proclaimed messiahs since the time that the Romans took control of that part of the world. And the religious leaders don't get it either. Or maybe they do. 
But either way, the religious leaders in Jerusalem know that they need to step aside and let Rome have its way with Jesus, whatever that is, so they can protect not just the power and status that Rome allows them to have, but their very physical safety. And late that evening in the temple, Jesus sees all of it. He sees the consequences of that, the consequences of all that desire on and insistence for and apathy toward violence. Violence as a means of control Violence as a way of building and maintaining a kingdom or a society. Violence of getting one's way. Jesus sees all of it. He sees the consequences of all of that for him, for the people, for the leaders, and for Rome. And not just in the days and weeks to come, but decades and even centuries later. The same kind of consequences and violence that Jesus addresses in the parable that he will tell just two days later. A man buys a vineyard, puts everything in place that he needs for the vineyard to be run, leases it out to tenant farmers, and then the man takes a trip. Now, for those of us who have understandably forgotten what that is, a trip is when you leave your home, get in some mode of transportation, and go to some other place generally speaking, some distance away, and preferably for enjoyment, just in case. Guy goes on a trip. Harvest time comes, and so he sends a series of servants to collect his share of the grapes, to settle accounts with those tenant farmers. But the tenants abuse and beat and even kill some of those servants, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And so the man has this thought. Well, I'll just send my son, who I love. They'll respect him. Nope. The tenants somehow think that, well, if we kill him, all this will be ours. And they do. And then Jesus ends the story with a rhetorical question. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will destroy those tenants and give, or more accurately, lease the vineyard to others. For the writer of Mark's gospel, this parable serves as an allegory allegory. An allegory representing the time and the circumstances that Mark's gospel was written in. A time about 40 years after Jesus' death and right after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Romans. So for Mark, God is the owner of the vineyard, the vineyard is Israel or Jerusalem. The tenants are the people and the religious leaders. The servants are the su succession of prophets that God has sent to the people throughout the centuries. And the son, of course, is Jesus. And for Mark, the parable represents the idea that the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple is God's 
judgment of and punishment on the people and their leaders for their rejection first of the prophets and then most specifically of Jesus. And there is a nugget of truth in that. Because Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed in a sense because of the rejection of Jesus. But what I mean by that is it is destroyed because of the rejection of Jesus's way. The way of God embodied by Jesus. The way of compassion and forgiveness and justice and kindness and generosity and mercy and nonviolence. The reality is that Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed by Rome because 40 years after Jesus' death, they tire of the constant attempts by the Jewish people and some of their leaders to drive them out through violence. They fight fire with fire. And of course, eventually, you know, the same thing will happen to Rome, because see, that's the thing about building and maintaining a kingdom or an empire through violence. At some point, somebody always comes along that's bigger and stronger. But as we have been discussing throughout Lent, the parables as Jesus originally told them were not meant to be seen as allegories, and certainly not allegories of God and or Jesus. And thank God for that in this case. Because if this is an allegory, and God is meant to be the owner of the vineyard, then what we have is an absentee God who seems to be clueless, careless, and out of touch with the violence going on in his own vineyard, doesn't seem to be terribly concerned with the violence being done to his servants, even to the point of being willing to send his own son into the midst of it. And then when the owner finally does respond, it is by adding to the violence exponentially. Instead, the parable, as Jesus originally told it, is not an allegory. It is, in the words of one New Testament scholar, a tragic story whose violence and horror doesn't end. Because the parable, as Jesus tells us, as many other of Jesus' parables, doesn't give us a final resolution. Yes, the owner of the vineyard does lease the vineyard to new tenants. But we have no idea if that means the chain of violence gets broken or simply that a new chapter of it starts. Jesus, that night in the temple, sees all of it. Sees all of it. Because it is the violence that brings him to the cross that doesn't end it. The violence that destroys Jerusalem and the temple doesn't end it. The violence that eventually brings down Rome doesn't end it. The violence in our time still doesn't end it. Another week, another mass shooting. And I have to confess something. I struggled a bit to ask you to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits the families and loved ones of the dead in Colorado. And it's not the first time I've had that struggle. It's happened a few times in recent years. 
I struggle to ask you to do that because we live in a land where this thing, kind of thing happens constantly. We live in a land where even outside of these mass shootings, the extent of gun violence in our nation this past year was the greatest it's been in a couple of decades. And our response to it constantly seems to be, to borrow the words from a headline in the satirical newspaper, The Onion, a few years ago, there's no way to prevent this, says nation, where this regularly happens. I hesitate, I hesitate to ask you to hold the families and friends of the dead in Colorado in your hearts and minds and spirits because I can easily imagine God responding to us with la 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 la, I can't hear you. And understandably so. And the thing is, I am not, I'm not someone who feels the need to ban guns in this country. I grew up in a house with a hunting rifle just like every other kid around me. I grew up among people who hunted as a means of supplementing their food resources, just as many people in other parts of this country continue to do. Now, why that's necessary in the richest nation on earth is another issue for another day, but it's a reality. And I also get, I have no problem, I understand the idea that there are a number of people in other parts of the country who have a need for a firearm to do things like, for instance, protect livestock. So I, I don't feel the need to ban guns. But at the same time, how is it that we seem to treat the Second Amendment as less viable than the First Amendment. If we have reasonable regulations on freedom of speech, for instance, you can't use speech to incite violence, why is it so hard for us to put reasonable regulations and enforce them on the very weapons that carry out the violence? As the avid hunter and gun regulation advocate John Rosenthal points out. If we insist on licensing and insist on not allowing certain kinds of weapons and certain kinds and amounts of ammunition for hunting, then why is that not the case for guns in general? Again, as we know, any issue like this, any social ill is complicated. There are a number of variables involved. For instance, there's you know, the influence of lobbyists, political pressure, things like that. But there are also emotional and psychological and spiritual factors involved. The journalist, John Lennart, suggested a few days ago that one of the issues that we have with all this is that while many Americans, while most of us are disturbed by the extent of gun violence in our nation, we are at the same time not disturbed enough by it to insist on something being done about it. By insisting on reasonable regulations and their enforcement, something that is not wild. It's not wild imagination. Me I'm talking about measures that the vast majority of gun owners, hunters, and law enforcement personnel support. Part of what may be going on for us as a society from an emotional and a spiritual standpoint is that we may be 
more and more becoming numb to it all. Research suggests that the human brain begins to have a harder and harder time not just processing, but feeling when it comes to acts of violence and destruction, when the level of that violence and destruction reaches a point where it is both exorbitant and consistent. In other words, while we may not, in the words of Pink Floyd, be coming comfortably numb, we are at least becoming uncomfortably numb. And that numbness prevents us, it makes it harder and harder for us to insist on taking the steps necessary to decrease it. And maybe we can't eliminate gun violence, but there are steps proven to decrease it. Again, steps that the vast majority of gun owners and law enforcement personnel support. It is as if we have taken the words attributed to Joseph Stalin to heart, to mind, to spirit, that one death is a tragedy, but a million deaths is a statistic. Or as one of the survivors from the Boulder murders put it this week, I know that in a week, no one will remember but those people will still be gone. Maybe that's what Jesus saw late that evening in the temple. Saw that if we don't at least try to take steps to prevent it, to decrease it, try to take steps that work or even might work to break the chain of violence. The chain of violence that led him, that brought him to a cross, the chain of violence that eventually destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, the chain of violence that eventually brought down Rome, the chain of violence that took place in Boulder last week and Atlanta the week before, the chain of violence that has led to thousands and thousands of gun-related deaths each year in this nation, the violence that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was a complete and utter rejection of, if we don't do that, it won't be just our brains that become numb. It will be our hearts, our spirits, our souls even. And as that New Testament scholar put it, it will be a tragic story whose violence knows no end. Amen.
I'd like to once again thank you for joining us here this morning at First Parish Church Congregational on this Palm Sunday, this beginning of Holy Week, for our time of remembrance and reflection and recommitment to God and God's ways as embodied in the life and teachings of Jesus. So now, my friends, it is time for us to leave this sacred space and go out into the world committing to refusing to allow ourselves to become numb, become numb to the gun and every kind of violence in this nation and everywhere else. Leave this sacred space refusing to allow ourselves to see the victims and the destruction caused by violence as a statistic, but instead as the very real suffering of our brothers and sisters as God's people. To see it the same way that Jesus did. The Jesus who entered the world, who entered Jerusalem, and who enters our lives bowing to help and to help us both heal the violence after it occurs and then do what we can to prevent it before it does. And for that, we say thanks be to God. Amen.